I'm Bill Dolly, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and we have a lot of new folks to here tonight, and I want to especially welcome you to the uh, this Archaeology Cafe. We are based in Tucson. We cover the entire Southwest. We're a nonprofit organization, and we've been doing this uh, Archaeology Cafe in Tucson for six years, and this is our second year up here in Phoenix. It's a very informal presentation in the sense that uh, Mark won't be using other than the handout that you uh, should have had either picked up as you came in or uh, have on your table, and a map here, and so no PowerPoint or that sort of thing. He'll be speaking in language that we all understand, uh, as opposed to archaeo speak, which only a few rarefied um, folks understand. Mark's talk tonight um, is on the First Phoenix Cemetery, and I want to make everyone aware, the, a good number of folks uh, here tonight from the Pioneers Cemetery Association, and there's another little handout on the table back there. December 14th is your event, and it will be at the Smirthwaite Historical Home. And anyway, that ties very much into tonight's talk, and I want to just now turn to today's speaker. Uh, probably many of you know Mark very well. Uh, he's been a fixture up here in the, the Phoenix archaeology scene for a long time. And he's done a lot of different interesting projects, uh, oftentimes bringing the historical context of archaeological work into uh, to, to supplement um, what is coming out of the ground. And tonight, as he looks at Phoenix's first cemetery, and more. Uh, we'll be able to share with him uh, that story and uh, there will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. There will be plenty of an opportunity for a conversation after uh, Mark makes his first round of presentation. So Mark, thank you for coming tonight. Cool. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Uh, there's nothing more than archaeologist likes than a good audience, especially one with liquor in them. <laughs> All right. Um, you mentioned the Smirthwaite House. Uh, ironically, we just did an excavation at where the foundation for the Smirthwaite House was. Small world. It's coming full circle again. And when I start this talk, it's also like a small world coming full circle again, because much of what uh, I've done in uh, Phoenix, downtown Phoenix, has been at small locations within the original Phoenix town site. So since archaeology deals with time and space, I'll start off with the space here. What we have is 7th Avenue here, 7th Street on this side, Van Buren at the north, and Harrison Street or the railroad tracks on the south. That's the original Phoenix town site. That's what was selected as the location uh, in 1871 when they decided we don't like living at 24th and Van Buren. We want to build a town site farther over where no one has the advantage of owning the property already. So at that time, they decided this is a good location. It's up high. It's away from the floods. There's no prehistoric material there. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> and this was their selection. Uh, they started out 1867, you know, and by 1871, they made the decision to move. The town or create a town site there. It wasn't until 1881, though, that they actually incorporated the city. So from 1871 on up to 1881, people were being buried at the cemetery, even though it hadn't been formally uh, identified as a city yet. The cemetery itself is on the west side of town. It's at this location here, uh, between 5th and 7th avenues, between Madison and Jackson. And the two city blocks were set aside early on. 1871, as I said, was going to be the beginning point of the cemetery. That's when we know our first burial was placed there. Um, when you look at the map here, you'll see that there's a lot of colored in areas. Those are archaeological project areas that have already been excavated in this area. And it's both for historic remains and prehistoric because unlike what they thought in the 1860s, 7, and 70s when they said there's no historic or prehistoric remains there, there are quite a few. And in fact, if you'll look on the east side, you'll see a large concentration of a 
a number of excavations that have already been carried out. And this is in what's called Pueblo Patricio. Pueblo Patricio has been dated as far back as AD 1 to 450, what we call the Red Mountain phase, and much later as well. It, it goes up uh, to about 1100, somewhere in there, uh, 1200 maybe. There's been some misunderstanding of what kind of a site it is. Many people thought, oh, it's a big village, you know, Pueblo Patricio, it sounds big, there's lots of big maps that show it as very extensive. It's really not that uh, extensive. It's a lot of small things, like what we found at Block 58. Um, I'll start off with the Red Mountain phase because that's the earliest stuff that we have here. But if you think about what was going on, where did these Red Mountain phase people come from, there's actually earlier material if you go towards uh, the confluence of the Salt, the Gila, and the Agua Fria. There's stuff out there that's as early as 3,500 years ago. And if you go to Frank Luke Air Force Base, there's stuff comparable age out there as well. But what we have here in uh, the original Phoenix Town site is at this location, we have um, a Red Mountain phase house, a couple of pits. If you go to the north where the federal building is, there's a, there was uh, a Red Mountain phase house there, a couple of pits. As you move over towards uh, Heritage Square and the convention center that was recently constructed, you have a lot of pioneer period, which comes a little bit after Red Mountain phase, but also Red Mountain phase structures in there as well. In fact, a fairly heavy concentration of uh, things that are around AD 450, 700 in there. And then when you come back more towards the center uh, where Bank of America building is and this new brand new cityscape, that's a concentration of pioneer houses that are going from about five, seven, six, uh, 600 to 700 and maybe even as a little bit later than that. So what we have here uh, is kind of a general view of where people were living early in the Hohokam or pre-Hohokam era. And it seems to be that they're scattered along all of what is the original Phoenix Town site. Uh, and if you go farther over towards La Villa, where the uh, PCA has Smurthwaite House and all of that, uh, you have Pioneer Period site there as well. So we have a series of occupations coming along through here. It's not really a real tight village that's just dense, except in La Villa and uh, as you go farther towards the east. So this is the other part of my talk. What we found at Block 58 was one Red Mountain phase house and another house that could be Gila Butte, you know, around AD 800 on up to maybe Sacatone, 950, something like that. Um, and we also had a curious concentration of ground stone artifacts in what looked like a cache. And I say it's curious because it's actually starting out a little bit higher than we anticipated. It was in almost where the historic uh, component was located. And you have to think about what you get, of course, in an archeological site. The stuff down below is older, the stuff up above is, is younger. And so th that cache of ground stone artifacts was kind of at the break point. And when I say break point, um, I should mention that what we had originally at, the gra at this project area was a graveled surface. And in the 2003, the county had come in and removed all of the buildings that had been there. Uh, a number of warehouses were still standing and they basically knocked down everything and took out the foundations and footers. So when you look at your map that is in a handout and shows the entire project area, you'll see a bunch of cross-hatching and stippling that says disturbance. Well, we had 75% of this city block that was already disturbed. So it's a two-acre area, roughly, and three-quarters of it was pretty much gone. And I'm talking not just ground surface disturbance down to maybe a foot deep. We're talking six, seven feet deep. So when the archaeology started out there, we dug backhoe trenches that were about four and a half to five feet deep to try and find preserved archaeological deposits. And we came across a large area that was previously disturbed, and we concentrated our work in what was left. And what you'll see on the small uh, map there is 
I believe, some gray shaded areas where we did maximum stripping. We took the ground down inch by inch with a backhoe. And we took out all of the cultural fill that we knew or the disturbances that were above it. And we got down to the point where we could see outlines of features. We saw these originally in profile where you would see a small, thin, dark band where a house floor would be. And that was where they had dug down an archaeological uh, house down to a certain level. And then as the house collapsed and degraded, some of the trash that would fill in there would stain the soil a little darker. So that's how we knew we had prehistoric materials. And then we started seeing all these strange looking rectangles out there with disturbance in them. You know, they had wood in it. And I thought, well, that's not right. This is at the level of the prehistoric site. Why would we have wood in, the how, in these, these kind of odd looking things? And I automatically thought disturbance. So this is your first training of what to do when you're a historic archaeologist do your archival research first. Because I totally missed out on the fact that this was also the historic cemetery. And that that little bit of wood that we were seeing in a rectangular shape was the top of a coffin lid. And so what we were seeing as disturbances, we never got down to in our backhoe trenches that were four and a half to five feet deep. These burials were placed almost a meter below what the prehistoric uh, features were at. So this is where, if you're looking for what you're hoping to find, you'll find it, but you won't find the other important stuff as well. So keep your eyes open. Um, the cemetery over here was two city blocks. When the first map was made of Phoenix, uh, C.J. Dyer's perspective drawing, he did uh, a nice little drawing of everything that was happening pretty much in the center because that's where most of the development was going on in 1889, 1891, when he did his, his drawings. And off on the side, he just kind of dark shades, lots of clouds, and you don't see too much. Well, if you go to the PCA's office at the Smirthwaite house, you'll see a huge blow-up version of this map. And you look close, and you can still see uh, what are apparently small fences, metal fence or wooden fence around grave plots. So they have a very good resource there. If you want to take a look, come on down and, and look at it there. What we found when we were stripping away, we got down to where the uh, prehistoric surface was. And like I said, they were rectangular outlines. They were kind of east to west, but they were also a little bit more towards southeast, northwest orientation of the long axis. Um, very sharp corners, very clearly defined. And occasionally with these small, thin, one millimeter, maybe two millimeter thick uh, stream of wood running off to a side. And then you would follow that down and it would disappear. And the walls would just keep on going. We got down like a foot deep in some of these things and the walls were just there, but nothing else. So like I said, when we went from the prehistoric surface down to the very bottom, it was another meter in depth, so almost to your waist before we got to anything that was identifiable as a coffin or human remains. Now what we did find was 15 features that we can confidently say are historic graves. There are probably, there were others that were out there. And we know that because newspaper articles were saying as early as 1889, hey, we found human remains over here on block 57. When they built the West End School in 1889, they were digging foundations and they hit burials. And they all scratched their head and they said, hey, two years ago we emptied out the graves. There wasn't supposed to be anything here. Well, this is obvious. Only two years after the last burial that could have been possibly made, four years, uh, they're finding burials. They didn't know where people were. There were no records kept. This cemetery, in spite of it being an official platted portion of the original Phoenix town site was never recorded as far as who was where. And so this presents archaeology with a really good example of people that are all put into one location. Do they have the same status? Yes or no? Do you put the same people close to each other if they're different religions or if they're different ethnic groups? 
So we thought, well, maybe we could try getting at some of that from the archival records. Um, it's not going to work too well. What we've tried is we use the PCA records, which has, I believe, 79 bodies were known to be planted in the cemetery. Add in the several, it was never determined how many, that were found in 1889 when they dug the West End School Foundations, plus another body that was found in 1935 in the roadway, which isn't in the city block. So all of these things, you know, like I said, this cemetery was not well organized. And in fact, that's one of the complaints that the people had in the 1880s, is it's so ugly, no one would possibly want to see it as they come into town. And, you know, coming this way off of Van Buren uh, was the way to get to Yuma. So people would naturally come past here. But the other way that people would come into town was on a railroad that came in on the south side and it then would wind up going up to uh, Ash Fork and Williams. And that's actually another part of our other stuff in the title of this talk. There's a railroad that goes down the alleyway of Block 58. It's not on any Sanborn maps. It's not in Dyer's 1891 perspective because it doesn't come at that early. So we're finding this information about the block that no one else had. There were newspaper articles that said, yeah, 1916, this guy applied for and received a franchise from the city of Phoenix to put in a, another railroad spur that came in. Never got anywhere. World War I's coming along. There's no financing available. There's no demand for it. 1923, the person that was really pushing for the spur came back from the war, got financing together, and immediately ran into somebody else's railroad that said, we don't want competition. And so this railroad floundered, basically. But not so much that they didn't build a portion of it. And in fact, there were three lines in, next to the alley. Um, we caught just the edge of this railroad at the curve. So they were kind of banked up to the side. One side is a little higher than the other. And three tracks going in. Uh, they used really, obviously, reused material. The railroad ties, the wooden ones that we found there, have uh, a bolt with two large washers on the end, and they're clamping it together because these things are splitting. And so if they had any weight on those tracks, they would have lost it. So they're reusing materials. They came in and they re-salvaged the stuff that they reused, in fact. So we didn't find any rails. All we found were the... Uh, plates that would hold the rails down to the wooden ties. When you got out into the street along here, uh, Fifth Street, you actually saw still in the ground railroad rails, the metal. So they didn't salvage everything because by that time they had already paved over it. So these things are sticking out underneath the asphalt. So let's get back to what was there after 1916 when the railroad did go in. We had a couple of houses up at the north side. We had a creamery at the southeast side. And I'm interested in the creamery uh, for a couple of reasons. A, it's a, one of these things that was very important in the World War I era. Dairies were a very important source, powdered milk, condensed milk, etc., going over to the troops for food. And it also provided the farmers here with a very large income. And it was an issue of who are you going to sell your milk to? And there were a number of creameries throughout the valley. So there was a big competition that was going on. Uh, ironically, when that creamery went in, it also impacted what was at the time, or previously, uh, an important aspect of the cemetery. The, the newspaper records that we have mention only about three or four people that are buried in the cemetery. Three of them were convicts. Two of them were lynched. One was a legitimate execution. So the other person that we know of note that is within the cemetery is um, King Wolseley. So if you want to be remembered, it's probably more important to be a murderer that's executed. <laughs> Because all the other 79 people, very little information about them. Well, we do have 
um, is name, sometimes their age, sometimes cause of death, and gender. So the gallows was at the southeast corner of the cemetery. And the newspaper article mentions that three people, the three convicted, or two lynched and one convicted individuals, were buried at that edge. Unfortunately, the creamery, when it was built, had a basement. So the chance for anything there being preserved, gone. The other things that we do know about the cemetery, like I said, we have 75, 79 names from the newspaper records that the PCA collected. We picked up eight more names from a search that Homer Thiel did for desert archaeology um, that looked through all the newspaper records and said where, what year people died. And he collected all the information about deaths in Maricopa County. There's no guarantee that those eight people extra were buried here. They could have been buried somewhere else. They could have been shipped back to family. We don't know. So we might have as many as 87 burials that we can deal with. And like I said, we only found 15 graves. So there was quite a few uh, that went missing. Um, out of those 87, the human remains that we found are only 10. 11, sorry, 11 individuals, 10 graves. We had one burial that had two people in it. Now, what we were finding, though, was so limited, we really couldn't be certain to say they were buried together. Because you've got to remember, 1883 and 84, the city council, the newly constituted city, has said, we're getting rid of this cemetery. It's in the edge of our town. We don't like it here. We're going to have a new cemetery, which turns out to be Pioneer Military and Memorial Park. Uh, we're going to move everybody over there. So starting in 1884 and 85, they uh, set out two contracts to move everybody out of the cemetery. And so they all went, the bodies went over to the, to the new cemetery now, except for the ones that were missed. Now, who's going to get missed? You would think everybody would have a gravestone. It's only been 14 years since the town was established. You must know where everybody is. Wrong. These people were missed. We had two individuals that were articulated, fully articulated individual, meaning their inhumation is still there, no disturbances. We also had at least the remains of three people that were caught with the bulldozer as the parcel was being developed. So we have at least five individuals that were missed, plus the several that were in West End and one individual 1935 discovery. So out of the 87, you know, we're getting pretty darn close to maybe a half a dozen, maybe a dozen people that were left on, in unmarked graves or not well marked, and it, so they were missed. The two episodes that were used to remove the inhumations, 1884 and 1885, uh, were issued contracts through the city, the town council. And the idea was everything would get taken out and moved over to the new cemetery. When we found these 15 graves, only five of them have evidence that everything is gone. The other 10 have either coffin elements or human remains and coffin elements. So this is real similar to what was found in other locations where there have been uh, exhumations of previous burials that there is a tendency for small bone elements to be left. Uh, if you can imagine, everybody's done eating, right? You pick up the carcass and you move it over, well, parts are going to fall off. Small bones, hands, feet, uh, throat. Those things are going to be left behind. They're not going to pick up large, they will pick up large elements. We found no skull elements at all, something recognizable they would see. Uh, in two cases, however, there's a uh, uh, exceptions to that. We found upper humeri in both cases uh, and a few smaller bones as well. So if you can imagine these, these individuals were probably uh, decaying for quite some time. Whether the cloth is what they picked up or if they picked up the fleshy parts to move them out, I don't know. But in 10 cases where we could find, the coffin was so badly rotted they didn't try to pick that up or if they did, it fell apart. So what are these coffins made out of? We have two types of coffins, rectangular, nice square corners, 90 degree angles, 
and we also have three hexagonal uh, boxes. In other words, they taper towards the bottom, expand towards the shoulder, and then taper again at the head. And not just that, in plan view, but also towards the bottom, they would have a V shape. So you're talking about something that's really hard to make. If you're an experienced carpenter, you can make those compound miter joints fairly easily. If you're just somebody that's using salvage materials and you've got a lot of nails, you'll make a square one probably and pound in a, a bunch of extra nails because maybe the wood pieces are a little bit short. And that is my conclusion based on how many nails we're finding in these grave sites. We had everywhere everything from 30 to 40 nails on down to maybe two or three nails. So these, the coffins that are being made and used in the Phoenix area you got a mix. You have some things that are really highly skilled, labor-intensive things, and others that look like they're nailed together, and if it breaks apart, you put in another nail. And so we were real interested to see what else we could find along these lines. And we found tacks and wood screws. But tacks are only found in these things that are made with uh, the hexagonal shaped ones. And we probably can assume that what they're doing is lining the, uh, the wooden coffin with cloth and the tacks are being pushed in to hold the cloth in place. Wood screws, a little bit more common, but still not that many. So they're using mostly nails, not screws. And the screws are very short, so they're not holding a lot of things. They might be decorative. And if you think about the, uh, the Victorian era, when they had these highly ritualized grieving ceremonies. Widows would wear black cloth for a year. You wouldn't uh, go out dancing or communing with friends up upon a death. You would take pictures of the dead in their coffin for remembrances. Um, all of these things that were highly structured and very much the beginnings of what we have now as uh, funeral rituals are starting out at these times. And so we can see a little of this in the types of cloth and other things. We had one uh, hexagonal shaped uh, coffin that had nice handles to it. And when I'm talking nice, I'm saying a cross had fleur-de-lis on the edge and they, they were the handles. One bale is what they're called, a single bale. So there were four of them two at the feet, two at the head, and you can imagine these were what they were carrying uh, the coffin with. Um, so where did these, they get these things from? If they're manufactured locally, yeah, possibly. You'd have to have a special carpenter, but they could also be shipped in. Uh, they might be expensive that way. Can you say that that's a sign of upper status? And the answer to that would be no because one of the things that you have to remember about the Victorian era is it's not just the wealthy that do try to show status, it's everybody. Everybody wants to be thought of well by their family members and by their other community members. So the fact that they could maybe scrimp and save and really splurge on that coffin does not indicate that they're high economic status. What they're aiming for is high social status, very different thing. Uh, same way with headstones, by the way. That's the most visible and obvious type of characteristic. You would not necessarily have that on everybody. But it might be for the people that are striving for a little bit more show. What we also see in the uh, dire perspective map is some of these outlines of fences around. And ironically, when we were done with all the analysis, we went to a location at the Pioneer Military Memorial Park that had a fence around a cemetery plot. This plot, however, had been reused or emptied, I should say, of the individual families that were there. So once you're in the ground, you're not necessarily resting in peace. These individuals were moved again to the Evergreen Cemetery off. So you're looking at things that are happening in a cultural situation. People are changing. They want their family in a better location. They want their family closer to where they live for whatever reason. So when we reburied these individuals, the most logical 
explanation of where they should go was to the Pioneer Military Memorial Park because in 1884 and 85, that's where most of the other individuals went at that time. And presumably these individuals, the 10 that we found, went there as well, or most of them. Uh, unfortunately, the location of the mass grave that they were all put into is unknown. So we're taking a shot in the dark. We don't know where relative uh, distance between all of these. So you can't look down on the folks in the 1870s and 80s and say, oh, you guys didn't keep good records, because even after that, records still were not being kept. That's life. Now, who were these people that we did find? Like I said, we had 87 individuals uh, that we knew of from records. We had 10 individuals, 11 individuals, sorry, that we had human remains from. And like I said, five graves that had nothing in it. So the analysis uh, was done on the human osteology. And out of those 11 individuals, we could only identify five of them because there are so few body parts that we could actually say anything at all about ethnicity or, or anything else. Uh, and it's not very satisfying because you're dealing with maybe one tooth that has a carabelli's cusp or some other characteristic that might be indicative of an ethnicity. So we had five individuals that are, we can just broadly say are Euro-American descent. We have three individuals that have Hispanic admixture. And obviously, uh, Spanish source originally in Europe, so they're Euro-Americans as well. You know, and the rest, we just don't know. There's not enough human remains to make any type of a judgment. And also, when you're dealing with human remains, you're dealing with statistical uh, analyses of the bodies and saying, OK, how many percent of the uh, teeth would look this way out of the burial population? So we're, we're left kind of up in the air saying their burial population from early Phoenix. The newspaper articles and other records that we have of the dead do not really give any indication of who they are as far as ethnic or religious or other types of things. We have surnames, um, not too useful. You can make assumptions and say, well, they could be Anglo. We don't know for a fact. Uh, and like I say, we don't know anything beyond that. What we do have at the end of the excavation in, in the block 58 is these individuals that were taken back to the lab, the analysis was done. The process is that Arizona State Museum issued us a burial agreement where at the end of it we said we would do an announcement in the public press and say, here are some individuals that we know of this amount. Do you have any interest to it? So we had a Hispanic group that came. The um, PCA was there. And I believe we had one or two uh, private individuals as well. We sat down. We discussed what to do with the individuals. The choice was made to rebury the body parts there at the cemetery. Um, the PCA found one grave site. We had a backup in case. We found other individuals or archaeological uh, materials there. And we went to rebury these individuals. Um, the worry is. The cemetery, the historic cemetery over here, is on top of the prehistoric site of La Villa. So depending on what happened in the past in this cemetery plot, there could still be prehistoric remains there. So we were in a quandary. If we started to dig the plot to rebury these individuals and we hit prehistoric remains, the agreement was stop, go somewhere else. So we had another backup plan. So La Villa by itself is a significant site. You don't want to be disturbing it if you don't have to. So that was, that was the decision made there. Anyhow, um, I believe in June 11th or something of this, past, of this year, we reburied the individuals. They each have um, a separate box. There is a hard metal tag on the inside that refers to their feature number that was found at block 58. And on the outside, there is a ceramic uh, file uh, as well, that gives the same feature number to it. So in the future, if someone does have to dig up these individuals, there will be a reference to it. But of course, the boxes are going to be rotting, everything's going to be slumping, and they'll be back in the same position before of going, I don't know, what is this body part from? Where is it originally? But I think that gives you a summary of what we did out there at the job site. 
Um, if you go past it now, you will see a new sheriff's office uh, building being erected. It has four or five stories. It's very modern looking. I believe it actually angles out over uh, kind of upside down pyramid, pyramid type. And it'll be used for the sheriff office, um, 911 call center and other things like that. So the reason that the archeology span was done is because it's federal or uh, public monies being used. And so this excavation was sponsored by yourself. Pat yourself on the back. And the county as well for doing the right thing. I'll answer any questions anybody has. Yes? All burial uh, goods that are found with human remains go back into the grave with that individual. So they are all in the boxes. On those uh, coffins where you found the tacks and you suppose that there may have been some material lining, was there anything left in the material linings? Was it all disintegrated? Could you tell if that was the case? No. What we were left with was a very desiccated piece of wood. I don't know the thickness of these, thing, these pieces of wood originally that they used, but obviously it had to be thick enough that the nail would fit to it without splitting it and cracking out. Uh, most of the nails that we found were about uh, three and seven eighths inches long. And so we're talking about something that's a good size 16 penny nail. Uh, the wood would have to be at least a half an inch thick. But after desiccation in the desert for 100 years, we found stuff that was maybe one to two millimeters thick. And that was it. We would take a trowel, swipe through it, and it was gone. So very little remained after this. Uh, what we did find, we piece plotted a lot of these nails in place. And you can see some of these things are uprights holding the end pieces that would have been close to the head in, in place. But there's like four or five nails in a stretch this long. And so these coffins are really flimsy or maybe they're made from recycled material that's not very thick and very large. Um, so that leads me to think that some of these were made locally and not necessarily brought in from somewhere else with these nice compound miter joints. Is there any indication uh, from any records that there were mortuaries uh, of that time period where there might be records of people that they buried and, and, whether they, and what kind of coffins they might have been in? Um, mortuary records, no. Uh, one of the things that I've done on another project for Cemetery Olindo, which is the uh, pauper's grave down by I-10, 17, and I think 15. Thank you. Uh, is look for records there, and they're very scarce as well. Incomplete records by the county and the city, both. Very few head markers. Some families did put out head markers, etc. So no, we're we're very limited in what we can get out of the records, archival research. Where where did the Red Mountain uh, name of a period come from? Not our Red Mountain, I guess. Red Mountain phase. Uh, is named for a site on the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community that is within view of Red Mountain. So that's, that name uh, was applied to it in 1969. Don Morris at Arizona State University uh, did an excavation there and applied that name. In the 60s, everybody was into naming things, so that was the phase name at that time as the type site. Uh, there also was a political issue that kind of over... Uh, was over this whole thing. The, the issue of the fact that uh, they may have been Mexicans buried under Joe R. Pyle's jail. <laughs> I was thinking you were talking about the 1860s, you know, the Civil War was still on, but yeah, um, there was that speculation in the newspaper at one time, and there is no evidence that these are executed criminals from the 1900s. Uh, and I can confidently say that because if you look at the uh, aerial photographs and all of these maps that we have, there's warehouses there up until 2003. Their warehouses are pulled off at that time and there's large holes dug into the ground. Now, could they have been buried in between 2003 and when we found them? Not likely. So, yeah, I, I can say archaeologically that there's no evidence of that. But the 1867 was just as interesting, too, because one of the reasons they built this over here is the people at 24th Street 
were a mix of people from Texas and Union people, and they were all living next to each other. They seemed to get along, but they weren't going to let the other guys sell lots for the town site and make a killing off of that. They said, let's build the town site over here where no one has land and we'll all be equal. What year do you think the first burials took place in the original cemetery location? Uh, the PCA has records from 1871, March. So, you know, the, the newspapers are fairly obvious, you know, looking for any news of what inequality they could get. So they're making note of these types of burials. So that's where we have some of the earliest records. I also assume that as uh, construction continues in the area, more bodies will be found. Uh, a lot of the construction that was there has varying degrees of how deep they went. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you know the area of the old cemetery, and as some of the buildings are torn down and new excavations occur, probably more bodies will be found, I'm assuming. The potential is there. If nothing else, the 1935 um, burial that they discovered was put back close to where it was found. And all we know is it's at 6th Avenue in Madison, somewhere near. So when you think about what was going on when they built this town site, the east half was developed first, and the west half wasn't even surveyed and outlined until much later, until the 1880s. So it's very possible that people were burying individuals close enough, somewhere out there, they knew there was a cemetery and they put individuals there, yes. Uh, block 57 already has a basement floor, so the other half of this uh, cemetery, the platted area, is gone. But in the periphery area, like you say, yes, there could be. Between the federal courthouse and the sheriff's office is one city block that's currently used as a parking lot. Red Mountain Fay's house probably going to be there, I'll bet you anything, because of what we found to the north and what we found. Uh, other features probably as well prehistorically. Historic, possibly as well. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention is the people that lived on the block following removal of the graves, I was surprised. One individual was there for almost 15 years. I'm shocked because the work that we've done over on this side of town People are moving every year, maybe six months. They're turning over. What you're seeing is the working class. They're coming in, they're working for a little while, they lose their job, they're gone. The person that stayed here for 15 years worked for the railroad. And if you know this area, Santa Fe Warehouse is right there. He could walk to his job. Do you have a name of that person? Uh, yes, I do, but not on the top of my head. It's in the report. What was the Phoenix population of when the cemetery started and what was its trajectory going forward? Yeah, If you go back to 1867, we're talking uh, probably a dozen or two dozen individuals that had farms or gardens. And at about, I believe the first census, 1870s, they're still not talking about more than a couple hundred. When they voted on this uh, decision of going to the new original Phoenix town site, there were about 350 to 400 people in there. And it was a close race, too. Uh, complaints of jury or vote rigging were rampant. Uh, people that they thought were Indians were voting and under the guise of being Hispanic. So if it sounds familiar, you know, it's still happening today. Uh, by, I believe, 1890s, I think we're up to about 1,200. And I'll, I'll bring in a little bit of the sidelight to what's happening in the 1890s. 1870s, when the town site is starting to be talked about, there's a serious depression, 1874. By 1879, it's back to normal, whatever is normal. 1893, another depression that lasts till 1896. So you see these economic peaks going up and down. Population in town comes and goes. The workers working class, even landed gentry, come and go. That's why you don't see people living at a, for a fairly long time period. If you have a death in the family and you leave the individual behind, the, you know, you don't come back for it when you see in a newspaper that they're going to move it because you're gone. You're in California, you're in somewhere else. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been well, a great presentation.